brown skin biracial parallels. So in an earlier video, I spoke about how brown skins and biracials are basically uh, <laughs> two sides of the same coin. And I decided to dive a little bit deeper into that as, um, as a concept, as an idea. So when it comes to the colors in conversation or discussion, brown skins are forced to pick a side or even both sides without belonging to either. We are our own group, yet part of both. It's an exhausting conundrum of experiences, so much so that it leaves many of us unable to adequately identify ourselves. We in turn say and feel things on the frequency of biracial children and people who decide to identify as black, although they are not, or who wish they were white, but are not, right? They get caught in the middle, caught in between, as are we. Many of us on the peanut butter girl spectrum can pass in different seasons as either light-skinned or dark-skinned, while many of us are both at the same time, light to some, simultaneously dark to others. The status of being a light-skinned woman in the black community has fierce gatekeepers of all colors among us. However, the most vehement gatekeepers of the status of red and yellow bones are biracial women, high yellow women, and the darkest of dark-skinned black males. Some of us are so thoroughly humiliated for identifying as light-skinned that we learn to identify as dark-skinned, although we are just as far from them as we are from the light-skins. Why would we, brown skins, collectively do a thing like that? Why would we purposely identify as dark-skinned knowing we are not? Well, because it's a softer blow to the ego to identify as dark-skinned and be laughed at than to identify as light-skinned and be completely berated, hated, and humiliated as a result. No, not by dark-skinned women or brown-skinned persons of either gender, but by the fierce aforementioned gatekeepers of light-skinned superiority. For this reason, we at times let random people choose what group we belong to. We accept their designation in the moment to avoid hurt feelings of both ourselves and others. Can you imagine for, for just a moment identifying as dark skin when you go to school, but as light skin when you get home? Your family sees you throughout the year. They see the blue green veins, the blue or green or blue green veins in your wrists, your breasts, the back of your legs and your pale face fresh after being washed in the morning. They see you, but perhaps your peers are only used to seeing you with a tan or oxidized makeup which gets darker by the hour yes foundation even if purchased a shade lighter gets darker with wear due to the natural process of oxidation there's a girl i love on youtube called too much mouth and she tries on different foundations and shows you the level of oxidation and how they wear throughout the day Sometimes we put on our makeup in the mirror and we're like, oh, yes, but we have no idea what that sucker is going to do two, four, six hours um, into the day. And so she uh, she helps us with that. Anyhow, the word is oxidation. This is like when you bite into an apple, which is close to white on the inside, turning brown, the longer it is left for the air to hit it. I convinced my high school that I was dark skinned unwittingly because of the use of makeup, which I purchased in my true color, but oxidizing, of course, right? Things like contouring and highlighting with these multiple shades of concealer and foundation, as well as setting powders has correct this, corrected this for many brown skins, thanks to modern makeup trends we had no knowledge of while I was growing up in the 90s, except for, I mean, maybe people in Hollywood or the drag community, but us regular degulars, we were just, you know, we had one color on our face. <laughs> We had a big pasty brown number, some NC45 from MAC, and maybe some black or brown lip liner and chapstick. 
uh, let's not. <laughs> so this is why you see women highlighting with concealer three and four shades lighter than them, but it comes together in a seamless way that truly matches the natural gradations of their actual skin. So you might see someone on YouTube doing their makeup and it's like, ooh, sis, that's not your color, but wait for it, right? Wait for the beauty blender, wait for the thickly packed kabuki brush or whatever, and you'll see that her mixing those light and dark shades is truer to her actual tone than, you know, some monograin monocolored face of you know nc45 or nw42 um my closest friends right back in school would get into arguments about my skin color with with others right with our peers and i would feel humiliated like on one hand i was relieved that someone saw me as i saw myself in the mirror but the comments that came along with it like you wish you were light-skinned were a nuisance and a non-truth I used to spend hours in the middle, hours in the middle, hours in the middle of the day and night in the mirror, dancing, admiring my reflection until I unwittingly lost 30 pounds, right? I was, don't judge me. My cheer skirt was a size six in high school when I got it. I needed a size four um, by the time I graduated, like my waist had just shrunken in. I loved my Simba colored skin. Yes, I mean Simba from The Lion King because this is how desperate we are for names. Like we don't know what to call ourselves. We just know what it looks like. Simba, like I remember the cartoon. I haven't seen, you know, the the more recent movie with Beyonce as Nala, but I remember those color crayons, that cartoon Simba. And I'm like, hey, there I am. Notice like Sarabi and some of the other lionesses, they're lighter than Simba, right? Notice Mufasa, he's darker than Simba. But I'm like, oh, me, <laughs> I'm Simba colored. Y'all don't judge. Judge, but don't judge. Harshly anyway. So in reality, I just wanted one place to belong and stick to. But the confusion of being something else wherever I went molded my relationships in life. Like, I've said this a million times on my channel, I have never had an African-American best friend, nor a white one, so I'll just throw that one out there, despite going to inner city schools, which were, I mean, f full of, I mean, the white people were minorities at my, um, my high school, uh, Franklin High School in uh, South Seattle, 98144. My closest friends were only ever non-black, mixed, or directly from Africa. So, I mean, when I say non-black, I could have just as easily put, you know, Polynesian, Asian, because um, that's what I do. Anyhow, uh, the peanut butter girl knows the privilege of being light-skinned as well as the soul-breaking discrimination that comes from being put down as dark-skinned. It is easier for most of us even still to identify as dark skinned because the status of being a dark skinned woman does not have as many gatekeeping guards. There's no VIP pass to get into that group. Being dark skinned is not the upstairs area of the club where Chris Brown and his crew are going to kick you out of. No, indeed. It's the bottom level dance floor anyone can walk into. I'm getting very Rachel Dolezal uh, vibes from that comment in terms of how, you know, anybody can be black. Anyhow, uh, that's not the point I was trying to make. I was just getting those vibes. Um, but yeah, it's the bottom level dance floor anyone can walk into. And even still, like when you get there, you're light enough to still get those looks that suggest, why are you down here or not up there? <laughs> it's like you don't qualify for vip you don't uh, qualify for the general area like just go home brown skin <laughs> we're not dark or light enough to be considered exotic unless of course featurism and texturism come into play we can be as dark as former mtv vj ananda lewis but if we've got a fine nose and coolie hair like she does by the way coolie is an offensive term um however Coolie hair is what is recognized when it comes to when you see these African-Americans who are all the way African-American in appearance or all the way Jamaican in appearance. But for some reason, you know, they've got really smooth, really silky, really type two or three A hair. Right. So this is a term that we recognize. 
Um, and of course, if you want to know what a coolie hair texture is kind of looks like, you can look to Ananda Lewis, who makes no, you know, who's like, look, y'all need to see my mom and my sister. I'm all the way black. My hair just came out like this for whatever reason. I'm all the way black, maybe with some Native American somewhere far, 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 far back. Um, the coolie is a word normally used to refer to mixed people who've got Indian um, in their family. So um, we can be as dark as Ananda Lewis, right? And so long as we've got a fine nose and her hair texture, people will bypass acknowledge, ad, acknowledging us as dark skin. I never heard anybody call Ananda dark skinned um, when I was a kid, but she was always darker than me. And so I was always like, huh, like I, I, cause I wanted to look like her, right? I wanted to look like Ananda so bad. And part of that was her color. Anyhow, she's got a great complexion. I'll try to throw in a photo of her. So, um, you have that with, you know, the fine featured dark skins. Whereas if we truly have Negroid features like that of Chloe and, ha and Halle Bailey, the, the singers of Do It, right? Um, Beyonce's, uh, Beyonce's girls. Um, if we look like them, gorgeous girls, but obviously phenotypically black with, you know, locked hair and everything, certain blacks will excuse you from being light skinned. Although, those two girls are clearly closer to light skinned than they are to dark, even with a good tan. So in this case, right, you might not get called light skin, high yellow, red bone, but you might get called food like butterscotch or caramel, hence the term peanut butter girls, right? The biracial says, I am black to one group, then says, I am biracial to another. And God forbid this biracial person is white passing because then they can say, I am white to a third party. Therefore, mixed people are more than racially mixed, but honestly mixed up even in the head and in the heart, confronting an identity crisis on a day-to-day -day basis due to being delegitimized and having no solid space of residence when it comes to identity. That's ouchy. That hurts. Did I say ouchy? You guys don't judge me. I was a school teacher, okay? I work with small kids. So... Me personally, I identify biracial people as biracial. However, a Michi X type biracial would identify as a black woman. And I wouldn't disagree with her. I mean, coming from her time and place as a Gen Xer, it makes all the sense in the world why she would identify thus. Whereas I could deeply, deeply offend a Gen Z teen or 20 something by referring to them as black when they're biracial. School-aged young people from all of the West Coast are saying things like, she's not black, she's mixed. And they're correct. Offended by being called black. Right? Physical features such as noses and hair texture play a role in this colorism confusion. I have heard it said that anything darker than Beyonce is dark-skinned. And honestly, I... I feel no ways about that as a statement, but I'm opposed to that only as an experience. It's one thing as a statement. It's another thing as an experience. I won't pretend for a moment to have gone through the levels of being called Midnight and Tar Baby that my older dark skinned sisters have, right? Beyonce cannot, you know, let me lay off that for a minute. So I'm not going to pretend to have my dark skinned sisters experiences, but I also can't pretend to have my younger sister's experiences who, you know, I never knew my father's validation or monetary support the way my biracial younger sister has, right? So I'm completely in the middle of these two sides. My biracial little sister, my older dark-skinned sisters, like I'm just a brown skin in the middle, not on either side of the coin, kind of like a biracial woman. Like many other brown skins closer to light than dark, I never felt comfortable calling myself light skinned. I would let other people say it of me, but never myself. My birth name is Chocolate Angel, which is why my channel is called The Real Chocolate Angel. Um, my name has been a very triggering thing in my life, uh, being named something like chocolate and then adding to that Chocolate Angel. Um, so as I introduce myself to people, they make jokes like chocolate. You look more like caramel to me or even others still saying to my dear mother, why did you name her Alexis and her chocolate? You should have named this one, this and that one, that, right? Because I came out the lightest with 
the darkest name. Now, my oldest sister's name is Latina, right? L A capital D I N A, as in you guessed it, Latina and Latino. This L A capital D I N A is the original spelling of these two words that the Latinx community uses to describe themselves. Uh, many people were called Latinos straight off of slave ships showing up in colors as deep as my own sisters. Sadly enough, at present, many of them disown anything related to her color due to anti-Black sentiment being a natural colonial hangover of racism and white supremacy. But in reality, they are using a word that describes her skin color more accurately than it defines any among them that is not an Afro-Latino or Taino. Read Sylviane Diouf's book, Servants of Allah, on the transatlantic slave trade, if you would like more history on the emergence and usage of the word Latino, which again evolved into being spelled with a T after being initially spelled with a D, like my sister's name. Also, the prolific author, uh, Sheikh Ant Diop, has written on this as well, just in case you were looking for reading on the subject. So all in all, this colorism cluster muck from many brown skins is about having nowhere to belong and being passed off between the two sides of light and dark like a hot potato. We identify as both and neither at the same time because the validation just isn't there for our color. Our erasure is more often than not invalidated and or missing from the colorism conversation. Where did the brown skins in music and television go? Y'all remember them from the 90s? Remember when they used to be everywhere on sitcoms, R&B groups, etc.? There's no need for us anymore. There's no need for brown skins anymore. We aren't exotic enough to be propped up like light skins nor relatable enough to be given the role of dark skin. No one seems to notice black women are now being widely represented in media, not only by biracial exoticals, but also by Yvonne orgy looking non-African Americans. What's that woman's name that I hate? Uh, Cynthia Erivo for having the nerve and the gall to play Harriet Tubman. Oh, you're getting replaced. (laughs) We're all getting replaced. (laughs) But like, it's becoming a light skin, dark skin thing where it's just like hire a brown skin for what? For what? The brown skin is distinctively, oftentimes, unambiguously African-American, which I guess is a problem because it makes others feel excluded from fictional characters they represent. You can give a biracial girl the role of a black woman and make it work for the masses because, you know, we all know mixed chicks. Or you can hire a West African to play the role of an African-American because folks can't tell the difference. But the brown skin is so near automatically identified as African-American that our appeal just is not as broad when it comes to casting. We've been cast out of the casting process for roles that reflect ourselves. At times, I feel odd about admiring my own color because I feared it would make me come off as a colorist and I hate, hate, hate colorism. But in reality, I, I mean, I get to be a fan of me and so do you. I mean, I'm, by that I didn't mean a fan of me. I mean, you get to be a fan of yourself. Many brown skins have this fear of appearing like some kind of a colorist and it results in our erasure because we don't speak up. We don't speak up because we understand the dark skin plight and we don't put ourselves before that because we're not delusional we know what it is we don't have a loud and proud cry like the dark skins or an army to gatekeep the boundaries of our identity like the red bones douglas and high yellow ladies this upload is an intro into understanding a nuanced cultural blind spot We neither have the most privileged nor the worst oppression among us. But if you care to know what an identity crisis it is to be a brown skin or peanut butter girl, then here, this message is for you. Uh, This is is really funny. I just actually had a dark skin beauty queen uh, tell me I cannot use brown skin either as a term because of Beyonce's music video. She said, if you aren't the color of the girls in the video, mind your business. It's not for you, right? I laughed, but then retreated into the recesses of my own mind, looking again for a flag, a label, a litmus for which to identify my Janet Jackson colored self with. (sighs) 
okay, my uh, my fellow Portia Williams is of the world. Um, that's all I have for now. Add what I missed below, right? Because no one's going to start this conversation for us. We kind of got to do it ourselves. Uh, sympathizers, empathizers, you're all welcome. Um, this colorism thing and its complications is something we have to face down together. And the only way to really undo this thing is to uplift the ones who suffer the most. So while I do hear light skin girls when they're saying colorism affects them too, you know, these Queen Nigers of the world, I'm not really trying to hear it. Um, juxtaposed with the experiences of dark skin women. You have to free her and her image. You have to free the dark skinned, unambiguously black woman and her image. And by doing so, we liberate the image of everybody. But if we, you know, pick the brown skins or the light skins, like we're really not doing anybody a service but ourselves. So it just takes some some level of emotional intelligence to comprehend that. All right, y'all. Let me know what you think and what I missed. Mwah.